All right, my dudes, I hope we're doing well. This is going to be our parallax animation tutorial. So we're going to be taking the file that we've now made in Photoshop and importing it into After Effects. Let's dive in and set this up. First things first, we're going to make a new composition, standard HDTV 1080 25. Make sure your frame rate is set to 25 and our duration is going to be five seconds long. All right, we'll say OK. And next, we're going to bring in our file. So navigate to the file that you've made, assignment one assets, remember to change the import as from footage to composition retain layer sizes, and then say open. Now a new little window is going to pop up in After Effects, and it's going to ask me, do I want to have editable layer styles or merged layer styles? We're just going to leave that as editable layer styles, and we're going to say OK. All right, and that then makes our composition for us. Now, when we bring this in, we've got these bunch of viewing guides. I think these are the styles that it was talking about. So we're just going to come on up to view and we're going to clear our guides because we don't need those. You'll see in our layers that we've got our OG folder. That's the guide that we had in Photoshop. And if with that layer selected, you hit T, you'll see that its opacity is the same as it was set in Photoshop. So that's actually a style that comes across. So we can leave that as it is. Um, and in fact, we're going to leave this, let's take the opacity down to about 30% for today, just so we can use it as a guide without it getting too much in the way. Okay, we're also then going to lock our OG layer. You can see that this OG layer is a little bit different. If we double click on it, inside of that are the two layers. So it's almost brought in the folder that we made in Photoshop as a composition. So we can still go in and interact with those two original images, but we don't need to. So we're going to leave them as they are. All right, the rest of my layers, what we're going to do here is we are going to select them all. So layers, um, well, all the layers, you might have cut them up into more layers than I have. So select everything else, all the Photoshop thumbnails that we see. And we're going to turn on this little option here that makes the layers 3D. Now, if you don't see these options, remember that you can hit the toggle switches and modes button. But we want to click on this far right little box here and it fills in with the wireframe of what a 3D cube would look like. And immediately what we can see is that we now have all these gizmos appearing on screen. So these little 3D interactable points, they are called gizmos, and they allow us to interact in three dimensions with our assets. Just to demonstrate, if I grab this front layer, for example, the green arrow, Y axis, allows you to move it up and down. Red arrow, the X axis, allows you to move it left and right. And then of course the blue arrow that you can just see over here is the Z axis. And that allows us to push this layer in 3D space. Now I recommend using these gizmos because if we just click and drag, if I kind of just take it and move it around, depending on what view I'm in, that can have very adverse effects on where I place this correctly. All right, so for now, just interact with the arrows to get them into the correct position. Okay. so. What we're going to do now is we're just going to clear our workspace a little bit so that we can have more than one view. Working with the 3D view, kind of just looking at it from the front really doesn't do us any favors because we've got no point of reference for how deep in space these images are. So first things first, what we're going to do is let's close all these tabs over here on the right. So I'm just going to click on all their hamburger buttons and close them all. And that's just going to give us more screen real estate to work with when we move on to our next step which is now. So the next step, what we're going to do is we're going to come down to the bottom right hand corner of our viewing panel, and you'll see it says one view. Clicking on one view, we then select two views. And now what we see is an active camera on the right hand side, our default view is simply looking at it from the front, what it would look like when we render it out. And we then have our view on the left, which is our top view. And you can zoom in and out of these as you normally would either using the zoom tool or scrolling in and out. But the top view gives us a great opportunity to actually see that these little um, cyan lines over here, all refer to the layers that we can see in our active camera. So we can see that they're currently all sitting in the center of our 3d space. If this is the back and this is the front, then this would be the middle. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the lowest layer. I like to start off at the bottom and work my way up. So selecting my backgrounds, so that's my sky over there. With the layer selected, we can then see that I can access my Z space gizmo a little bit easier than I could in my active camera. And I'm going to push that to the back 
of my workspace. And you'll see that as you push that back, it almost looks as though we're scaling that layer up and down. All right, but what we're actually doing is that we're moving it further away from the viewer. So we're going to do our initial setting, kind of just pacing these out, paying more attention to the left hand side than the right hand side. Don't worry about the black spaces that are going to be created. We're going to deal with those once we kind of just push these out in Z space more correctly. So grabbing the next layer and working my way back, I'm now going to start positioning these like so. And you can see that they all have their own visual cues. These, layer, um, these layers are quite visible when you click off of them. So just make sure that they're stacking out on top of each other nicely. We don't want to have them sitting on top of each other or going too far back or forwards. It's a little bit of a trick of the eye to see where we're going to place them. But uh, with a little bit of practice, it makes sense. Okay, now at some point you're going to get to a middle point. So for example, my middle point is not going to be the plant. So I'm going to go on to layer six, for example, layer six is that portion of mountain over there. Now, I don't want to push this any further back, I want to start bringing layers forward. So I'm going to leave layer six where it is. And I'm going to grab the next layer, and I'm going to bring that closer to us. Now the bottom of our screen is closer to the viewer. So we're just going to make sure that these overlap nicely here. And then I haven't forgotten about the plant layer, the plant layer is my layer seven, and this is going to be closest to the camera. So I'm going to put it there. Alright, so your positioning does not need to be the same as mine, you're more than welcome to uh, push these out further or closer together, you're just going to end up with slightly different results from me and that's perfectly fine as well. Alright, as long as they're no longer sitting on top of each other, and there is actual space between all these layers, this is then what we're left with looking at. Okay, now, this view here is not necessarily what we're going to see in our final render, let's come on over and click back to one view. So we can zoom in a little bit. Now, we actually need to make a camera in order to correctly interact with these 3d layers. So we're going to come on up to layer new camera. And that's going to open up our camera settings. So after hitting layer new camera, we can now see this little uh, pop up window here. There's two different types of cameras, single node and two node cameras, we're going to leave it on one node for now. You don't have to rename it, we don't have to change the preset, we're just going to be using the bog standard camera. So we're just going to say OK. And now you'll see that your view has changed slightly. And you can actually see that by just clicking the visibility of the camera on and off. And you'll see that those layers are being spaced differently. And that's because when we have a viewing camera that is turned on, it applies its camera effects to the 3d layers in the scene. There's a lot of different effects under the transform options as well as under camera options. And we're going to be going through some of those once we've correctly placed our layers. So the next thing that I'm going to do is just to make my life to work in this uh, scene a little bit easier. I'm working on a very small laptop is I'm going to just reposition my uh, timeline panel. So I'm going to hover over at the top of the timeline panel, you'll see by my mouse, I get a little double white rectangle icon to the bottom right of it that shows that I can reposition this window. So clicking and dragging, I'm just going to drop it on the left hand side of my viewing panel. And then I'm going to squash these in on top of each other. So that I just see the layer name, I don't need to see anything else right now. Um, we will be scaling some things up as we go. So in fact, let's actually just leave. Let me grab a layer and see when we scale just enough space to see the three scale values. That's something else that's changed as well. There's now such things such as scale, rotation, there are more options for these, because we've got 3d objects, we'll be taking a look at them in a little bit more detail, probably in the next tutorial. But just so you know, when you go into the transform option, now there's going to be a lot more options than we might be used to. Okay. So the next step now is because we've pushed them in Z space, and we've got an active camera, we now want to position them correctly on screen. Okay, so that just means grabbing our reference footage. So our OG layer, I'm going to turn off all of my layers over here, except for the camera, because the OG layer was not made 3d, 
this is still our or a representation of our original image. And I'm going to use this as a guide to grab my layers and to move them roughly into the correct positions. Now, when we're closer to the camera, these objects are going to be larger. So that might make them a little bit difficult to place correctly. As we move further away from the camera, our objects are going to be smaller than they would have been. So again, we're going to be using this as a guide. And after that, we'll do a final refinement of scaling our layers to help fill in the gaps and then jumping back and forth between Photoshop and After Effects in order to fill in anything that we might have missed. Thankfully, the software does allow us to retroactively fix issues. So I'm going to speed through this. I'll see you guys on the other side. All right, so I've now got into the phase where my layers are getting a little bit smaller than they originally were. So for example, this little mountain top over here, if I just turn off my reference so you can see which one I'm working with, the one with that long twisty road on it. This one, what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to scale it up ever so slightly. So just hitting S for scale, holding down command or control while clicking and dragging on the scale value to make it increase in smaller units. I'm just going to have it fill the space. It's a little bit of a tip or a little bit of a trick rather. Um, it's going to, we're not going to do it too much. So I'm not going to scale my cloud all the way up, but I just want to make sure that I'm kind of filling the same amount of space that it originally took up in the image, just to help me when I'm filling in my gaps later down the line. And these clouds over here. This mountain range, for example, I'm going to scale up as well. So I'm going to hit S for scale and just scale until roughly the same proportions that it was. Now this scaling is going to slightly diminish the effect that we initially or that we're going to be working towards achieving, but it's going to benefit us in the long run because it's going to allow us to not have to paint in as much information. So we are still going to be going back and painting, but we're kind of just trying to mitigate the amount of effort that we need to go back to recreate. This mountain range here, for example, is going to need some real work. So I'm going to hit S for scale. I'm going to take up to, up to about 120%. Because it's so far away from the camera, because this is one of our real background elements, as it were, we can kind of get away with this. And I'm just going to push it over so that the edge of the layer is sitting flush with the edge of our screen over there. This one here. roughly like that. I'm going to hit S for scale and take it up to 120% as well, just to help me fill that space. And then lastly, we have our sky. Now the sky, we're going to um, scale all the way up. So we're going to hit S for scale and we're going to hit scale until it is filling up that screen like so. I just want a little bit of overlap off the top and to either side of it. And now if I turn on all my layers, you can see that we're filling our spaces with only few little gaps in between. One of those gaps is going to be a cloud here. So I just need to find where that is. Um, I can see that I'm going to need to do some deep edging on my let's take that cloud over there to fill that hole. Let's take that cloud over there to fill that hole there. Okay, so I need to do some deep edging on my plants. This was definitely a rushed process. So I need to do some more cleaning up over there. Um, this back cloud over there, I'm just going to move down slightly. So this is now the phase where once again, we're just refining what we've placed so far, just to make our scene look a little bit more accurate. It no longer needs to look exactly like the reference footage. Now we're filling in the gaps. It's going to be our own scene slightly. And because of the way the camera is going to work, it's not going to be that big a change to what we're doing. Okay. So let's go ahead and now save seeing as we've placed this up correctly. So just command or control shift S. And I'm just going to call this tutorial. But you guys can save that as assignment one. Okay. Now just to show you, 
I can jump across into Photoshop. I've got the file open here. And it's the exact same process of cross play between Photoshop and After Effects as it was between Illustrator and After Effects. So as long as I do not create any new layers, and as long as I do not rename any of the layers that I have here, any changes that I make and overwrite to my save file will update in photo in After Effects, I mean. So just to make a very clear one, let me grab this and with my brush tool, I'm going to just quickly paint out an area of information entirely. So if I jump into After Effects, that information is there. In Photoshop, it's now gone. As soon as I hit Command or Control S to overwrite that save, when I jump into After Effects, it's going to overwrite and that information will disappear. All right. I'm going to undo that and just overwrite my save once again so that it re-updates. So this is going to now allow me to zoom in here, deep edge my plant a little bit more. And then uh, when I bring it into After Effects, I'm going to be able to then adjust further. It's a little bit of a hole occurring over there that I've just seen. And that's actually a very good point. The next thing that we're going to do as well is just turn on our little... Um, What's that patterned toggle transparency grid? That's the word I'm looking for. I'm just going to turn that on and off and I'm going to look for any flashing areas that I can see that's like popping through the holes. It's really only this one down here. So I'm just going to shift this layer across slightly to help me fill that space there. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick deep edging of my plant and then uh, we'll continue from there. All right, so I have deep edged my plant a little bit more, so that's looking a little bit better. And uh, it's updated now in After Effects. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to bring our two views back up. So we're actually just going to go up to our window. Let's go to Workspace and uh, we can just reset our default workspace just to get everything back to the way it was. And I'll just quickly take a few seconds to close these down because now we're going to be working with actually animating our camera and we want to be able to see our timeline. We're also going to bring our two views back up so that we can see what our camera looks like interacting. Okay, so our camera is obviously this pink box over here and this pink triangle that is shooting out from it is its depth of field. So this is what it is seeing essentially. And with the camera selected in my top view, I can then move that back and forth by clicking and dragging on my Z space um, little handle. And you'll see that as we do that, our layers obviously interact with being closer or further away from the camera. So this is the effect that we're going to have. We're going to have it pulling out and possibly doing something to the side while it's going. Maybe we grab the Y orientation and turn it a little bit. So we're going to really try and highlight the fact that this camera is existing in a space. In order to do this, we are going to open up our camera options. We've got transform and camera options. So you can just open both of those up there. And to see what these do, we first have position. Now, obviously position deals with where our camera is on screen. So the first value is our left and right axis. Our second value is up and down. And our third value is Z in and out. A lot easier to work with the uh, handles for those. Then we have orientation. Now orientation is split into three different properties as well as X, Y, and Z. Now X, Y, and Z refer to these three just listed on normal orientation. But having normal orientation and animating these three gives you one keyframe, whereas animating these three separately gives you three keyframes to work with. I think that's why they've set it up this way. We're going to be interacting with the actual X, Y, and Z, just so it's a little bit easier for us to follow along. So X axis orientation, that's going to tilt us up and down. Y axis orientation is going to tilt us left and right. And then Z axis is going to rotate as though we're sort of tilting the camera in our hands. Okay. Then under camera options, we have got zoom. And you'll see that as you increase or decrease zoom, that the actual pink triangle that shows us the depth of field or the, the sort of point of view rather, that changes as we change our zoom. So we're going to leave this on 1500 for today. We're not going to play with the zoom at all. Depth of field, we are going to turn on. However, depth of field really affects our machine's performance because it then needs to start working out what needs to be in focus and what needs to be out of focus. So we're gonna do depth of field last. That will be the final cherry on the cake for our camera animation. 
aperture and blur level only become useful once our focus distance or sorry depth of field is turned on so once depth of field is on uh, focus distance aperture and blur level become important to us so we're going to deal with all of those at the very end the rest of these down here we don't need to worry about at all so it's really only the top five that we need to worry about okay so let's close up the camera options and we're going to just animate some camera movement to begin with so to start what we're going to do is let's bring our camera forward uh, so i'm just clicking and dragging on this little z space icon here and i'm moving my camera forward and we're going to get it to about here just where the top of our plant is kind of sticking out we're going to create a position keyframe at the start of our timeline now for a smooth transition we're going to have two sets of keyframes for our properties only one at the beginning of the timeline one at the end of the of the timeline we're not going to be having anything fancy in between so what we can then do is go to the very end of our timeline and let's pull our camera back out a little bit and we're going to pull it out maybe not too far maybe kind of just to about there we still want a lot of information you can see these little highlights sticking off the page and that's because when we change our orientation we don't want to see those black gaps appearing to either side of it okay so i'm just going to undo my orientation change there but now we have our camera pulling back in space let's also maybe change it so that when we start off we're slightly higher up so if i come over to my position option here and grab the second value that's my x value let's bring everything down so that we're just looking at those nice mountains in the background for now and then because we already had a keyframe at the end we're just going to come back here and change our exposition here and bring that lower down all right that seems to be oh silly me it's because i've got both keyframes selected so with the one keyframe selected set it so that our camera is sitting nice and up in the air let's put it about there and then as we're zooming out it moves down to get more of it in frame so that's already looking pretty cool next thing that we can do to add this is some orientation now like i said we're going to be taking a look now orientation and the rotations that we took a look at they they function in roughly the same way so let's make an x and y rotation keyframe we're going to leave orientation for now and uh, we'll just come back to the very end of the timeline. And we want it to end like this, I think. We can always change it. So we'll just make some blank keyframes at the end as well. But this is just going to give us something to compare to. Playing with the rotation is going to work better when we're closer to the assets. Because there's going to be less black spaces that we could accidentally reveal. So I'm going to... Let's start us off by tilting the camera down slightly. So maybe a value of like minus 10 for our X rotation. Um, and then Y rotation. Let's take it on over to the right hand side. So maybe about there. Let's say plus 5 for Y rotation. And let's make it minus 5 for X rotation. It's looking a little extreme with minus 10. Now that we can see as we're scrubbing through we have a little bit of that visual distance going on there. Perhaps we change things slightly to the other side. So if we had minus five for X rotation, maybe plus two would allow us a little bit more. And then we could always change our X position to bring our camera even lower down. Something like that. And for our Y rotation, let's make it minus two and we can then set it up so that our camera shifts slightly to the right so now i've now actually moved its position keyframe as well slightly to the right and this is going to create a cool little visual effect going on there okay then what we can do is let's save so that we don't risk the uh, risk the chance of losing our work here so command or control shift s and uh, we'll just overwrite our previous save okay let's do our depth of field next so what we're going to do is we're going to come on over and turn over to just one view again and then what we're going to do is if you've got a slightly slower machine like mine then turning on depth of field as i said really can strain and tax your machine so make sure that you save we've now prepped all of our images correctly um, definitely some things that i could clean up but you know what that's just the case of it let's go over and also just close photoshop if you have that open 
just so that we're saving our machines a little bit of their space. And then we're also going to come down to our resolution. Um, let me find my resolution options here. And I'm going to drop mine to half. Now, by default, that's going to make things slightly blurry, but it is going to make it a lot easier for After Effects to then work with the depth of field. And I can do some test renders at the end to see what that looks like. Okay, I do remember, I do need to remember to turn my resolution back up to full at the end. Otherwise, when I render it out, it's going to be at half resolution. Okay, so please remember to come back and change this to full later. With that done, we're going to come into our camera. We've got our keyframes for our movement here. What we can do is someone just go ahead and apply some easing to them. We don't need to worry too much about going into the graph editor for these, but easing will definitely help. And playing that back, it's looking fairly interesting. I see some holes appearing in the center. I'll have to keep an eye out for that. Um, I can find maybe what that layer is there. That's one of my top ones. I think it's this one. Shift that over slightly. Scrub through. Make sure that there aren't any more holes appearing, but that seems to be about it. Okay. Going into our camera, we're then going to take a look at our camera options. And we're going to turn on depth of field. And then we can come back and just grab two views again, just so that we can see the depth of field has now extended our visual triangle a little bit. This now lighter pink line that we can see visible is our depth of field. Anything inside these portions over here is going to be visible. Anything beyond that pink line is going to start then um, becoming a little bit blurred out. So we're going to go to the very end of our timeline and uh, just so that we can see more of our image. And we're now just going to play around with our focal distance. I'm going to push the focal distance out quite far. So maybe to about 1000, let's make it 1850 for now. And then aperture, we're going to pump up quite high. And blur level, we're going to leave at 100%. And you'll see if I pump the aperture up super high. So if you take aperture up to 783, notice how everything in the front is super blurry, while everything in the back becomes nice and clean. When I take that aperture down to 100, for example, my plants become more visible. So we want to find a bit of a sweet spot there. I'm going to take it to 350. That's a good one there. And then blur levels 100%, which is fine. And we can actually animate our depth of field and our or yeah, we can animate our depth of field on and off, but we can animate our focal distance changing as well. So if I bring this lower, then uh, the objects that we bring into range of that focal distance is going to be visible, and everything beyond it is going to be invisible. Okay, so we're going to be animating our focal distance as well. We're going to start off with it out here, chilling at the back. So let's zoom to the very beginning of our timeline here kind of just bring this so we can see the sky and those back mountains there create a focal distance keyframe and hit f9 to apply easing and then at the very end of our timeline i'm going to bring my focal distance down because i want to see just these mountains and this plant that's sitting in front of us in more detail so it's going to create a sort of focus pull effect Try and find a bit of a sweet spot here. That's maybe a bit too intense, but that's fine. I mean, this is just to showcase the actual effect. So if I hit spacebar now, what's going to happen is not only is my camera moving through the scene, but our focal distance is also changing. So these layers that are closer to us, they're going to start off super blurry when they come into focus or come onto the scene rather. And then they're going to come into focus as that focal distance adjusts or changes. And that is our parallax effect. Super simple, super basic for this exercise. Obviously, we now understand that we can do a lot with this when we get to our Renaissance animation. All right, so we're gonna leave it there, nice and short. As I said, most of the effort for parallax effects goes into the prep work. After that, the animation is quite simple, obviously depending on what we need. Um, I could still go back and animate the clouds moving, so I might do that. Um, you know, maybe grab the cloud layers, if I can find them. Do, 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 do. There's one, so I'll have a position key on that cloud and position key on this cloud. 
And is that a cloud back there? Yes, it is. So just gonna go and put position keyframes on all of our clouds. That's mountains, that's mountains, that's a cloud. And that'll then allow us to have some nice drifting as well. So we'll just start off that they're in their original positions here. Maybe we have the clouds. This one over here, they're all gonna be shifting towards the left. So I'll start off with this cloud further to the right. This cloud can be further to the right, further to the right and further to the right. Uh, rotate that down slightly just so it doesn't look as though it's a ship sinking in the sea kind of thing. And then at the very end, we're just gonna have them shift over to the left. So there. Obviously, we need to be a little bit smart about how far we move them. The clouds that are closest to us will move further. Obviously, you also want to make sure that we don't accidentally close any information or open any gaps along the way. But then simply slap some easing onto those so that they have a more of a drift effect. And there we go. Okay, this cloud's definitely moving too fast or too far. I'd need to go and change that slightly. Uh, not have it move as much, but it definitely adds a little bit to our effect that it is moving. So I'm going to grab it here and just move it slightly further to the right there so it doesn't move as far. And that is our effect. Okay, so a parallax effect, nice and simple, but creates a very cool effect. We can still go and spend a lot more time refining a lot of this. I'm just trying to rush it along so the tutorial gets out sooner but uh, do spend some time refining through, do see what else you can do with it, play around a little bit and enjoy it. I personally enjoy parallaxes a lot because you get to cut up something that would normally not be editable and bring life to it. And uh, I hope that that resonates with you. All right, so we're gonna call it there. Thank you very much. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Ciao.